Are you okay? I am live. I'm a few minutes late. I was just setting up some things here, getting ready for tonight's show. Got my notes ready. I think someone is going to be bringing me some hot tea in just a moment, and I cannot wait because I'm cold. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get things moving also on Instagram and going live on that channel as well. Please hold. All right, guys, here we go. All right, seems like everything is work. Yay, all right, we are on Instagram Live as well. Okay, guys, as you get started, I'm starting to see some folks jump on board. So as you come on board, don't be shy. Let me know who you are, where you're from, and what is in your mug this evening. Hey, we got Susan coming in from Canada. We've got my other Canadian there, Tom. Guys, welcome. Thank you again for coming. All right, I'm running a few minutes late this evening and I do apologize. Hey there, Beth, my resident snowbird. Yes, I love it. And you're my expert resident snowbird, Beth. Uh, thank you for coming on board this evening. All right, guys. And we've got uh, some folks joining in on the uh, Instagram channel. So I see we've got uh, Jules, we've got Ryan, and we've got a couple of other handles on here. We got Pam here with water. So guys on Instagram, don't be shy. I know I'm, I'm kind of new to streaming to Instagram and sometimes the rules there are a little bit different, but I want to hear from you guys. Um, so please feel free to throw your questions into the comments section. Let me know who you are, where you're from, and what's in your coffee mug. And I am massively missing my coffee mug right about now. We got Emily coming in from Central PA with her but oh, butter pecan hot chocolate. Man, Emily, you always have the best drinks. Hey, Glenn, what's going on, man? We've got Scott coming in from West Virginia with cold water. Susan's got water in her Yeti. We got Kimberly listening in from the YouTube channel, drinking her coffee. Jody, Jody, please send me an email with an update as to how you're doing, darling. I'm glad to see you here tonight. We got Eric drinking his HIC orange. Wow. He's, oh, it's high C, high C, HIC. Oh my gosh. As if I weren't a child of the eighties and I didn't know that acronym. All right. We got Dean coming in from Hollywood. Dean, I'm so glad you were able to stay up with us and that you're with us on YouTube. So I'm glad you found that link, my friend. Uh, we've got Benny from, Hey, what's going on, Benny? We got Kay Levinson in Chicago visiting her new prosthetist and with her new socket. So excited about that. Kay. Uh, we've got Felicia coming in and Marianne, Marianne, holy cow. It's a beautiful day in South Dakota. It's 50 degrees. It was actually colder here in Tampa than in South Dakota. How do you like them apples? Yeah, it was like a respectable 40 degrees this morning. It was uh, not a fun run this morning, let me tell you. All right, we got Don from, oh, from Vancouver having his coffee. Don, thank you for joining in, and I have questions here this evening. All right, and again, we got our folks in on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. It's a party. All right, guys, I am going to go ahead and get started this evening because I know I did jump in just a little bit late. We've got Jim coming in from the St. Louis area. Nice Malbec. I got some good stuff, man. Y'all need to send me some of these drinks at some point. All right. So for those of you joining me for the first time, welcome. My name is Cosi Belloso. I'm a physical therapist, amputee specialist here in sunny, not so hot Tampa, Florida. Uh, I've been a PT for over 23 years and my passion is working with the amputee and limb loss community. So here we are today. We've got some questions that came in through the text messages and I'll be sharing with you guys, those of you who are not signed on to my texting service, I'm going to just throw that into the comments section now um, because it is proving to be such a wonderful way for y'all to be able to communicate with me and I really love it. Um, so for those of you who have not signed on, here is my text. So just text COSY TALKS, all caps, one word to that number right there that I just posted, uh, and you can receive my text alerts. Uh, the nice thing is I will not spam. I will not um, sell your number, and you can actually text me back and text me your questions directly. So here we go, and I have my lovely fairy here who is bringing me my hot peppermint tea. Thank you. Yeah, there's my little fairy right there. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. All right. We got Randy Archer coming in from San Diego. We got Denise coming in from a much cooler North Carolina. I believe there's hope for winter weather. Oh, wonderful. All right, guys. So I have, I'm, I'm smiling from ear to ear and I'm a little, little more dressed up today. I was uh, recording for my new uh, podcast that is also going to be on the YouTube channel. So I'm going to ask you guys questions more about that later because I want some input from you guys on this. But let's go ahead and jump in with the very first question. Uh, this one came in from Emily. Emily says, 
I'm a lifelong bilateral KFO leg brace user. So KFO stands for knee, ankle, foot, or uh, orthotic, right? So it's basically a brace that uh, controls, helps control and stabilize the knee and the ankle and the foot. She goes, now I wear prosthesis on the left side and the KFO on the right side. I never had issues with being able to walk with KFOs before my amputation, but my prosthesis takes considerable effort to even try to take a few steps. I know the prosthesis is considerably heavier than my KFO. Can you explain the components of the prosthesis or why it is so much heavier than a leg brace? And yes, actually, I have parts of a prosthesis here. And of course, nothing seems to be working this evening when I need to get stuff. So, all right. So we've got the parts of the prosthesis, right? We've got your socket. And if you're an above the knee amputee, you're going to have some flavor of a knee joint. And then you're going to have a long metal pole. It's called a pylon. Nothing too fancy. And at the end of it, a foot. And I just realized I actually don't have a full length prosthesis. All of these sockets that I have are from old prosthetic devices that we took apart and we gave away the knee componentry and the foot componentry and tried recycling them. So that's why I don't actually have a full length prosthesis in my studio. Um, but y'all get the picture. So Emily, yes, you're right. Uh, your prosthesis is definitely going to be heavier than your orthotic, but your prosthesis is not going to be as heavy as your anatomical leg, right? And this is something that a lot of folks, when they're new to using a prosthesis, they don't realize this, right? They'll put a prosthesis on and the first thing that they feel is like, man, this thing feels heavy, right? The brain is still adjusting to recognizing that leg as their own. So it's going to feel heavier, even though it's actually lighter uh, than your old anatomical leg. And we're talking about even some of the heaviest legs on the market, right? So that's the first thing there. Your brain is interpreting this as still a foreign object that you're carrying around. So it's going to feel a little bit heavier. Okay. A couple of things you want to check there. You want to make sure your suspension is done correctly, meaning the way the leg is being held onto you is good and solid, right? You want to want to have a good suspension. And then you guys always hear me talking about having a good socket fit, right? If the, if the socket is not fitting well, then you're not going to get good suspension and you're not going to get a good fit and it's going to feel heavy. Okay. Now let's take into account Emily's particular case, right? She has a history of spina bifida. So, and she's shared that with us on several occasions, um, on, on the show. So Emily, in your case, because the muscles in your residual limb have weakness from the spina bifida, then yes, it's going to make that leg feel even heavier when compared to someone who does not have spina bifida. Okay. Now here's where I want to talk a little bit more. So here's the second part of the question. Uh, Emily says, my physical therapist tells me that I tend to stand on my toes rather than being flat footed. I've always stood that way. I don't notice it. When she tries to have me stand more flat footed, I don't feel stable, right? Trying to take a few steps is still pretty challenging. I feel like I'm having to learn a new gait pattern. I was never good at reciprocal walking. I used a swing through gait instead. Can you explain the difference between the two gates and why the gate I'm using as a swing through is making it more difficult now to walk with a prosthesis? So Emily, this is a really, really great question. Hola, comadre, glad you could join in. Okay, so when it comes to a gate, right, what, what Emily described as reciprocal, reciprocal gate is what we associate with normal gait pattern, meaning you're walking with one foot and then the other, just like, you know, I'm sorry, using my fingers, right? Versus a swing through gait, okay? So guys, just picture in your, breath, in your head when you see someone using two crutches or perhaps you have experience with this yourself, right? So if the person has the two crutches underneath their arms, they put the two crutches in front of them and then they swing their feet through. So it's like crutches, swing feet through, crutches, swing feet through. That's what we call a swing through gait, right? Does that make sense so far, guys? Am I explaining this well? Can you give me a thumbs up and let me know while I take a sip of my peppermint tea? Right? Let me know if that made any sense. Thumbs up, thumbs up.
There's like a delay in the comments coming in. Okay. Kay gave me a thumbs up. Okay, guys. So if someone is walking with a swing through gait pattern, okay, it means they're using their muscles in a different way. They're not going to be walking reciprocally. It's going to make their center of balance a little bit different. Thank you guys for chiming in. I appreciate that. Thank you for all the thumbs up. Okay. So it's going to, it's a different gait pattern altogether. Emily, you said it perfectly. It's a completely different gait pattern. Now the question is, why would somebody walk using a swing through gait pattern? Okay. Uh, for example, when someone's using two crutches, meaning they can't put probably weight on one of their extremities, or maybe they're walking around with just one leg, using a swing through gait pattern is energy efficient and less impact on the one leg. In Emily's case with the spina bifida, Okay, because her muscles were weak, it was probably more efficient for you to learn how to walk with a swing through gait pattern. Okay, now the fact that you are toe walking, right? So you had spina bifida, obviously, since birth, that's, a, that's, that's something you have since birth. So you didn't have the normal development of putting the feet flat on the floor during the development of your gait when you were a baby and approaching the one year and two year and three year old mark, right? Uh, the mature adult gait pattern, here's a nice useless Jeopardy factoid, is old, right? So the first eight years of a child's life are spent developing their gait pattern. It's kind of fascinating. And it was always something that I was just like, whoo, made my mind go crazy when I worked in pediatrics, right? There's so many changes in development that happens in those first eight years, right? So when you have something different in the situation, such as spina bifida, a lot of things are going to be different in that gait development pattern, right? So for you, Emily, it meant that you just developed a toe walking pattern, okay? Um, so what happens with this is that there will be shortening of the tendons, right? The muscles are going to be developed differently. Your movement patterns and movement strategies, meaning how your muscles work together head to toe are going to be different. Okay. Now, again, when I first practiced as a physical therapist, I actually worked in pediatrics and I loved working with children. Um, and it was definitely a challenge to see, okay, how can we take something like spina bifida? How can we take a child who has cerebral palsy, right? And teach them how to walk and try to minimize as best as we can some of these gait deficiencies that might develop because we're thinking down the line as an adult, we want to prevent any, any issues from occurring, right? Okay, so Emily, I am not your physical therapist. And I do have to say that, right? I have not actually physically laid eyes on you to look at your gait pattern. So I am totally playing Monday morning quarterback here. Okay. <laughs> and I want you guys to understand this because I don't want you going back to your PT and saying, well, Cosi said I should be doing this and that and the other. I am trusting your physical therapist that she is doing what is best for you right now. Okay. Questions that you can ask are, uh, where does your physical therapist see you at the, at the finish line? Like, where does she think your finish line will be? Is she hoping that you will develop a reciprocal gait pattern with your prosthesis? Is she trialing it out to see if you can, if you can be successful with this? Um, and this is a really, again, this is a really tricky thing for a physical therapist, right? We are the experts of gait assessment, gait analysis, gait diagnosis and gait treatment, like gait, that is our thing. That, that is one thing I'm going to be real territorial about as a physical therapist. Right. Um, but it's a lifelong learning, you know, thing. I've been studying the human gait cycle for over 30 years. And sometimes I feel like I'm just barely scratching the surface. So in the past, when I've had someone like Emily come in where they had a different way of walking prior to their amputation, right. In the beginning, as a novice therapist, I used to want to fix everything, right? I used to say to myself, well, they may have been walking like that before amputation, but no, 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 no. We're going to teach them how to walk the right way with, you know, after amputation. And then with years and experience and training, I realized, you know, I really have to pay attention to how the person was walking before they came to see me, before their amputation. And I have to take into account how many years they were walking this way. And then I have to assess what changes have their body has their body gone through because of how they walked 
Okay. And guys, this is just the nature of the human body. If you were to do a gait assessment on me, I'm not an amputee, right? I'm going to have gait deviations and my body is going to have asymmetries just from being on this earth for, for many years, right? And walking the way I do. Okay. So when you're trying to teach someone how to walk again after a trauma like amputation and having to use a new prosthesis, right? Among the many factors you're looking at as a PT is the history. Okay. And having to discern as a clinician, what is it about their prior gait cycle that I will be able to improve upon? And what are the parts that I'm simply going to have to work around it? Does that make sense, guys? I know I'm like, does this make sense? All right, let's see. I'm going to read some of these comments that just came in. Hey, what's going on, Ben Gregory? Thanks for joining in. Hey there, Kays. We got Kays and K. I love it. Um, Beth, yes. Beth is saying, would the tendons in her ankle be shortened due to not walking flat-footed? Can those tendons be stretched by exercise? So not just the tendons in the ankle, but moving all the way up the chain, right? So because she was toe walking, I mean, she could have changes all up and down the spine, okay? Does it mean that these are changes that are pathological or dangerous or a problem? No, it just means these are the, this is the way how her body has accommodated over the years with a different style of walking. Okay. Whether or not that can be modified. Yeah. That's something that the therapist needs to look at. And again, unless I'm there holding that foot and ankle and maneuvering it and manipulating it, I'm not going to know if that's going to be changeable or not. Right. Um, so again, that's up to the therapist who's treating her to have done that kind of assessment. So again, I am playing Monday morning quarterback here, guys. I am guessing that her therapist may have seen that, yes, we could work around this and we can try to teach her that flat footed, not flat footed, but the more stabilized gait pattern with reciprocal gait pattern. Yeah. So Emily says, I learned reciprocal walking, but swing through was always easier. So that's what I always did. Probably drove my PT crazy. Okay. So Emily, again, yes. And, and again, this is where sussing out that patient history. And again, I, I love as much as I talk on this show, when I'm with my patients and that, that first few appointments, I zip it and I let my patients talk to me because I want to hear about what happened to before they came in to see me at my office, okay? Um, because this is where you can learn a lot more. So again, just putting pieces together. If I have a patient who comes in and says, yeah, I used to walk reciprocal, but it was easier to do swing through because it was more energy efficient. I might try teaching the patient reciprocal gait and just trying out those gait mechanics just to see like, hey, can we get anywhere with this? And then just kind of take it from there. You know, are there times where, you know, I... I submit to the patient's old style of walking. Yeah. And I've mentioned this particular example on many occasions. I had one, this was probably the first patient that this ever happened to me. One of my first amputee patients, he was a below the knee amputee, a man probably in his late forties. He was in decent shape and we got him walking really well, but we had a hard time getting him to let go of his cane. Like I could not I did all the balance exercises with him. I did everything I was supposed to do. He was one of my first patients. And I'm looking at my mentor and I'm going, I don't understand why he can't let go of this cane. And I don't know who came up with the light bulb moment, but we figured out that prior to his amputation, he had an inch difference, inch difference in leg length. Like one leg was a full inch shorter than the other. And he had never had that corrected. He had always walked that way his whole life. So because of that, right, his pelvis was tilted and he had a little bit of a curve to the spine. So when they fit him for his prosthesis and they put him even Steven, well, you know, if your pelvis was used to being this way and now you're trying to even it out, right, you can see how that's going to affect all the alignment. And it was throwing him off balance. So we said, okay. We're going to take you back to being an inch shorter on that side. Lo and behold, he was able to let go of his cane and walk independently and no other issues, right? So again, you got to kind of, you know, as a therapist, when you're a clinician, you have to look at the whole picture. You have to look to the past. You have to look at the present and you have to look to the future. So Emily, my, my, if, if your therapist is thinking, yes, she will be able to walk with a reciprocal gait pattern, 
then yeah, it means it's going to take a lot more work and effort on your part because you do have some things that you are working against. And the weakness from the spina bifida is going to be one of those things. Um, but again, Emily, just, just ask your therapist, hey, what's the next goal? What are your thoughts on this? Do you think I'll be able to use reciprocal gait? And just get the therapist to talk to you about it. Thumbs up? Okay. All right, we got Christy coming in from Nebraska. Harsh is here with, yes, Mission Gate offers amazing programs on this. Uh, let's see. Hey there, Rube. Oh, it's Dave Fink. How are you, Dave? Um, Emily says, I feel like they're trying to get me to walk, to walk the right way, and I've been getting frustrated. Like, I have to unlearn 25 plus years of what I know worked before. Okay. And again, Emily, talk to your therapists, tell them the things that you're telling me here. Um, and that's a decision you need to make with your team. Okay. Um, there are times, like I said, in the past where with some of my patients, I, I came to the realization that the traditional gait training techniques I was using was not going to be the most efficient for them. And it was not going to allow them to have the most independence in their life. Right. And, and, you know, sometimes you just got to get to that point where you're both meeting in the middle going, okay, at the clinician side, my treatments aren't working and the patient's trying to tell me that it's not working and we need to pivot and try something else. Okay, Emily. So again, talk to your therapist about this. Talk to them. Hey there, David. Glad you can make it, man. Glad you can make it. We got Elizabeth here. Um, so Elizabeth says, I'd love to know what the difference is for me. I'm a leg amputee on crutches since I cannot wear a prosthetic. I'm exhausted from walking on crutches for the last 14 years. Um, so Elizabeth, would you mind just kind of clarifying for me what your question is that I can help you with? Um, is it that you want to be able to wear a prosthesis to perhaps not take up as much energy with your walking? Can you just give me a little more details there? Um, Christy says, I still use the four years, left knee bent and needs knee surgery. Um, and it is exhausting. So uh, let's see. Good. Hey there, Jerry Ann. Um, <laughs> Thomas. Thomas is my prosthetist and I always love when he chimes in. He says, true wisdom begins by knowing that we know nothing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And it's funny. I used to be scared when I was a younger therapist, I used to be scared to say, I don't know, or I don't understand because, you know, you're supposed to know everything when you graduate college with your degree. Right. And I think the older I get and the body, just the human gait cycle alone, the more I realize I have so still to learn. <laughs> okay. And it's fascinating. And that uh, goes high because I'll, I'll, I'll read literature and I'll learn something from that literature. Go, oh man, I have to go and learn. I didn't understand this part about the study. I didn't understand that. Right? Energy use, and specifically about energy use and fatigue due to CRPS. I can't use the prosthetic. Okay. And Elizabeth, I've actually done um, a show on CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome, and it's in my YouTube youtube channel um please hit subscribe i'm trying to kind of increase my subscribers there um and you can go through the live video archive and you'll find one on crps so when it comes to energy efficiency and it's interesting we talked about energy efficiency and how much ut is using right so we discussed how the higher up the amputation, the more energy the person is expending to walk. Now that's with a prosthesis, right? But I mean, obviously it translates into if you're only using one leg to walk, it's going to be exhausting. And then in your case, Elizabeth, if you're using crutches, I mean, we use our arms to walk. That's part of our normal gait cycle, the normal human gait cycle. But when you're having to put weight into your arms and really it's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. Um, so Elizabeth, again, I don't know much about your story, but you know, uh, cardiopulmonary endurance when walking, especially with my amputees, I mean, you gotta, you have to work on it. And, and I know you're already walking a lot, probably with your crutches. Um, but this again, might be a nice 
uh, reason to go and see your physical therapist. Um, in the past, I used to work a lot with uh, COPD patients, CHF patients, and working specifically on their cardiopulmonary endurance. And we're talking about people, some people who were getting close to having heart transplants and lung transplants. So their endurance was very, very poor, but we were able to work on it and make small improvements, right? And in the life of an amputee, maintaining your strength, but also maintaining your endurance is incredibly important. Whether you use a prosthesis or crutches or a wheelchair for your mobility, you have to have good endurance, right, to get through your day. So Elizabeth, this is something where I would say, you know, find a physical therapist, right? It doesn't even have to be an amputee specialist, right? A physical therapist can take your medical history, number one, screen your medical history and make sure that they can put together a cardiopulmonary program that would be appropriate for you, right? And hopefully get your energy up and going just a little bit more. Um, the other thing I'm starting to kind of just learn more about in terms of my own personal health and also what I recommend to my patients is looking into your nutrition, right? I'm, I'm really, the, the, the older I get, the more I realize that what I put into my body really has an effect on my energy levels throughout today, my performance as a runner, um, and just being able to get through my day. So I'm kind of starting to kind of push that out a little bit more as a suggestion for, you know, take a look at these type of things, right? Hang on, I got one question over on Instagram. And Pam asks, so before my amputation, I walked pigeon toed. My prosthetist insists my foot point outward. This is hard for my brain to accept. I have difficulty walking with ease and it's frustrating. Yeah. That I totally see. And, and it's, it's, you know, when we talked about what it is that you looked like before amputation, right? This is something you really need to communicate to your prosthetist and your physical therapist. And actually the show that I, um, <laughs> so I'm writing like the podcast and I'm writing the blog that goes with the podcast. Um, so one of the things in the, in the second blog I'm writing right now is certain things that you need to communicate to your prosthetist and your physical therapist when you go to get fit for your purse prosthesis, right? Your not just the picture in front of them of the person sitting in front of them now, but they need to see what you were prior to your amputation, right? That's going to tell us a lot about what we can expect for you with your goals, about how to fit your prosthesis, about whether or not you're going to need a mobility aid to walk right? Very important. And it's very important for you all to communicate to that us, to us. And unfortunately, sometimes some clinicians may not necessarily ask these really specific questions. Okay. But it's something that you can bring forward to your, to your clinicians. So for me, yeah, if I see my patient come in, right. And their foot is like massively in external rotation. The first thing that goes through my brain is, okay, the process is probably set it this way because they wanted to give the patient a little bit more balance. And so they're setting it out. But I always make a point of asking my patient, Hey, is this how your foot normally is? And is your sound foot, does your sound foot always go out like that as well? Or like, you know, what was the reasoning that is doing this? Can you tell me about this and follow up with that? Okay. So yeah, and in cases with an Thomas, if you're still on board and you will into this, I'd love to hear your opinion as a prosthetist. But if if somebody has been toe entire life where their 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 toes are turning in, you know, to put their prosthetic foot facing out while their sound limb is still facing in, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Or at the very least, the prosthetist should hopefully be willing to just play around alignment until they find something that works. And again, this is where the physical therapist needs to be a part of that conversation too, because we're the ones having to teach you how to walk with it. Yes. Okay. We got a lot of comments coming in. I love it when you guys put it in the comments to breathe for a moment and listen to you. Um, Elaine says, I lost my limb at age 15 and am now 68. I did a wonderful job for many, many years, but after a hip replacement several years ago, my gait has gotten terrible. And again, Elaine, this is where you're going to hear me get on my soapbox and say, go see a physical therapist. I'm assuming you probably, hopefully, after hip replacement that they sent you to go see the physical therapist. Um, and I'd be curious to know, like, you know, what is it that happened during that time, during the healing process from a hip replacement? that changed your gait mechanics. Um, you know, I've seen several amputees who have had gait replace, excuse me, hip replacements, knee replacements on the residual limb side, on the sound limb. 
they were able to recover quite nicely with a very if this is something that's really bothering you again go make an appointment with a physical therapist have them evaluate your gait pattern, your balance coordination range of motion see if there's anything that they help make your gait you know a little more efficient there um robin says first time listener here i've been a quad amputee for two years thank you so much for joining and uh thank you for sharing with us and and again comment section guys i'm going to take this time to go ahead folks who have just watching the show you would like there it is text box all caps to that number you'll receive my text alerts when i go and also uh text and your questions as well jerry and that i forgot to mention i'm a bio okay sorry you guys i'm like trying to catch up with all these comments. hey there kathy all right so david says i'm having to relearn gait because of my new foot versus the foot i've had for five years which was the highlander so he's now in the ibex and now it's a, a highlander yeah and guys you those of you who have been with me on the show you know my i got like a million soap boxes like i could run a whole like bath and body work store with all the soap boxes that i have as a pt um but one of the things i do say is you know and it, it hopefully encompasses all of this is having a relationship with your physical therapist is just as important as having the relationship with your doctor and your prosthetist okay whether you're an amputee or not but especially if you're an amputee okay your body will continue to age over the years things will break down things will get worn out okay you might get a new foot a new knee a new alignment and all of these things will cause changes to your gait and having that physical therapist there that's keeping an eye on your gait pattern and just checking in with them periodically it could be just as little as once a year after you're an established amputee right or in david's case he just got a brand new foot that works a lot differently than his old foot right so checking in with that therapist to make sure that you're not experiencing gait deviations right or uh like the person i think her name was elaine who said she had a hip replacement that's a big event right there that you definitely want to check in with your PT and have a good established relationship there. Okay. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. Um, Christy says, that's me. I ride the walker and my arms feel it. Yeah. Beth says, man, Beth is my poster child right there for physical therapy. I'm going to make you my poster child for PT there, Beth. She says, I've been, I've had four new prosthesis in five years and I've had to go back to PT every time, every time. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Drew says, I put my Revo on without any stabbing pain. And after a few hours, it starts to stab me. Any ideas what to look for or check out? The socket's not rotating. The liner's not moving. It's like I lose a little volume. And after a few hours, just to start the stabbing pain from the brim, I have my first OI appointment on Tuesday. Um, so just to kind of troubleshoot things, Drew, could it be that you're tightening it too much? Um, you know, sometimes I've seen folks you know, when they have the dial for the Revo fit, the Revo fit is a type of adjustable socket system, guys. Um, and you basically, here, let me get the right dial. This is like my demo socket. So it's got a, like a lot of stuff going on right now. Okay. So sometimes if you're, you know, tightening the socket quite a bit and you're cranking, 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 and you can crank too much. Okay. There is sometimes too much of a good thing. Drew, my wonder, because you mentioned the word stabbing pain, and that to me just kind of like clicks off um, nerve pain. So have you ever been evaluated for maybe a neuroma or maybe a bone spur that might be kind of sitting there or maybe even just some scar tissue um, so that when you're tightening that socket, it might just be pushing up on that area. Right. Um, Jerry Ann says it would be nice to show some PT things to do when getting out of a wheelchair and getting ready for prosthetics. What do you think? Jerry Ann, I think I may have the answer for you. Please hold. Now, Jerry Ann, I know that you're a bilateral, but I did create a program for above the knee and below the knee amputees, and it has 150 exercises for beginners and and advanced amputees. I have a low the knee book, I have an above the knee book, and I'm actually running low my above the knee books. That's why I don't have it there. But it's head to toe exercises. So there's arms exercises, 
exercises, less core flexibility exercises. A lot of exercises in these books and in those videos. I love videos, honestly. The book is all the videos. Basically, in the first day after surgery, someone who's transitioning a wheelchair user to uh get lost it's safe hopefully i am not frozen i'm just gonna keep talking hopefully you guys are still hearing me okay so basically jerry ann just, just yes this program has exercises in it that can help prepare you for using a prosthesis uh the best thing you can do jerry ann is again get the to a pt and those of you who have my books, have my videos, you have been taking these to your physical therapy sessions, which is great because then your physical therapist can work together with you to show you which are the exercises that are best for you. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm trying to back up. I'm trying to like back up to the last <laughs> comment that I had. Hmm. Emily says, does the rigidity of the prosthetic foot affect walking? Oh, that's, <laughs> you know where I'm going to go with this one. My prosthetic foot feels wobbly underneath me. I'm used to a rigid ankle because of using KFOs and my prosthetic foot or ankle area just feel unstable. Yes. And let me, I'm going to dig through this hot mess of a pile I have here as I destroy my studio in the process. Hang on. Here we go. Now we're going to call this guy old. Did I just knock down my tree? I totally just knocked down my tree. Yeah. Good morning, America. Here I come here, guys. All right. So let's talk about rigidity of a prosthetic foot. Let's let's this is this is old faithful, right? This thing has been around longer than I have. And that's saying something, right? It's a satch foot, right? Solid ankle cushion heel. And you can see solid ankle. And I guess you can call that a cushion heel. I'm really having to dig my thumb in there to have any give. It's basically a wooden keel. So meaning just the inside, if you x-rayed this, you'd find like a slip of wood and it's got this neoprene covering over it. And right here in the heel, there's like a little cushion, a little rubber, I don't know, foam. I don't know what those things are made of, right? So basically the movement you get from this foot is by putting weight into it. And I can't because I have don't have enough strength in my hands putting weight into it <laughs> to get this neoprene, this rubber, whatever this material is, to bend around the wooden keel inside, okay? That's how you get movement in this particular foot, right? This is an old foot. Now, the way the more modern feet work, you have so many kind of different feet. You have this foot, you have single axis foot, you have multi-axial foot, dynamic response, energy storing, hydraulic foot, did I get everything? No, we got microprocessor feet, stubbies, and running blades. Ha, got all that in one, right? So basically you activate these feet by putting the load, putting your weight into the keel of these feet. Some of these feet are made by the carbon fiber. Some of these are made with like College Park has their IntelliWeave. Um, they have all sorts of materials and the materials will deform under the load and then they'll come back together right? And depending on the kind of foot you have will determine how that foot will move, okay? So yes, the rigidity of the prosthetic foot will definitely affect your walking. Something like this that's incredibly rigid, right? It's not going to move a whole lot, okay? Who would that be good for? That would be good for someone who is not very stable, that's going to be good for someone who does not have a lot of mobility, right? It's kind of like, and please excuse the analogy, it's kind of like walking on a peg leg, right? It's a very simple form of walking. And again, whoops, it could be a safe form for somebody who does not have a high level of mobility and who does not have a lot of for someone for example, some of my above the knee amputees who are elderly. It's very poor. The satch foot might actually be. Okay. And now with some of the more uh, feet that we're seeing out there on the market, yeah, you're getting some great mobility, storing and energy reach. 
but you also have the balance and the need to be able to appreciate what those feet can do for you. Right? So Emily, in your case where the feet wobbly underneath, right? You need to have with your prosthetist and your physical therapist saying, you know, his foot's, you know, is still feeling wibbly wobbly. Is it because I'm still learning it or is this happening now? So just, you know, just things to ask, just things to ask your team. Uh, Wendy says a quick hello on the patient navigator at the amputee can always help. Oh, well, Wendy, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to give a shout out right now to the amputee coalition and specifically their certified peer visitor program, the CPV program. Y'all have heard me mention this a lot before. It's probably one of my favorite features. Of, and there have been many of my paid viewers that I've referred to the amputee certified peer visitor program. Um, so again, this program is designed to provide you almost like with an amputee buddy, right? Somebody who is in the community that has received training, who is an not people like me who are clinicians. Who, these are amputees. They've been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt and also some extra training, right? So if you are someone who is new to being an or know someone who is new and is struggling and just need a wonderful program. And you can go find the Coalition website. All right, let's see. Thomas says, with an intact leg, she can modify her effort. Fine to toe. best, but the stand on the lateral side, slowing back. Once we get mind control, she's got eight. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so Drew's do not change the tightness when it happens. Going back to his adjustable socket and the uh, uh, stabbing pain that he feels to both sockets. If you're not, if your limb is shrinking and you're not the tightness of your That'll definitely cause um, and pain. not necessarily uh, recognize that you're getting, that you're bottoming out, right? Sometimes folks don't realize that they're hitting the bottom of that socket because the sensation on the bottom of the limb isn't maybe not be completely normal uh, pain. In your socket, you can, there's a couple little old school tricks that I like to. Um, one of them would be to use red loops. Using now, and put a little mark of red lipstick in the bottom of your. Okay, so right, you see that part right there, right all bottom of the socket. You can stick there because when you put your red lipstick it, your residual limb should not be all the way on hitting the bottom of your socket, right? It should almost hit the bottom of your residual limb, that red lipstick, you're bottoming out, okay? Another thing, if you don't want to mark it up with red lipstick, right, or your wife doesn't want to let you use her nice expensive red lipstick, um, you can get like a little ball of Play-Doh or Silly Putty, like a pea-sized amount, roll it into a little ball and put it at the bottom of the If you your limb and that will bend out, then you know you're bottoming out in your socket. So those are just two really quick and dirty ways of knowing if you've been bottoming out in your socket. Okay, que mas? Ah, uh, Joan. And Joan, it's, girl, you and I need to catch up. It's been way too long, but I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay, Jerry Ann, you do have the below the knee book. Okay, great. So Jerry Ann, if you're looking to transition to using a prosthesis. Again, I'm not your therapist. I haven't seen you. I don't know what you got going on. But if you go, for example, to the phase one leg, leg strengthening, start with the phase one, phase one core, phase one arms, phase one leg strengthening, um, especially with the straight leg exercises without the prosthesis. Those are just really nice, simple, basic exercises that will target all the main muscles in your residual limb and in both sides. Okay, so that's a nice, nice place to start. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate the, the endorsement. Thank you very much. <laughs> scary foot. I like my foot, Susan. I don't think it's so scary. It, it's old and it needs kind of a, you know, a little makeover there. But, you know, it's good old faithful right here. Uh, David says, some people don't tell the whole story. I have a hot spot that develops below my kneecap. Um, <laughs> 
Cozy will give you an answer, right? Um, what I didn't say was that it developed at hour 16 out of my 18 hour day. That would change the answer completely. Please tell us the whole story. Oh dear. Yeah. Um, so Emily says, I, st I have a satch foot and it still feels wobbly. Emily, I would, again, sometimes I wish I could just like have you guys in my studio so I can just like look at you and, and, and see what's going on and give you definitive answers. Right. Um, it could be, it's just the general, uh, weakness perhaps from the spina bifida. Look at the proximal strength, meaning the strength of the muscle in your hips or glutes and see about strengthening that to help with the stability right there. Okay. And then going back to, you know, I don't know if your therapist is giving you exercises to do at home, but what are simple stability exercises that you could be doing at home? Even just as simple as the weight shifting exercises, right? Ask your therapist for that. And again, continue to communicate with them. I'm not feeling stable. I feel wobbly, right? Let them know these things. All right, I'm just clicking back to my Instagram channel to make sure I'm still there, which don't know if I am or not. Ah, there I am. Apparently I'm still there. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, Scott says that program was awesome when I lost my leg, the certified peer visitor program and still great friends with my visitor. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim, for putting that up there. I appreciate that. Um, Oh gosh, Randy, I am sorry. No, for whatever reason, my connection tonight, I see it blinking on and off. So I do apologize, guy, if I'm guys, if I'm freezing. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot I can do. I'm just, this is just what my Wi-Fi is in the area that I am in. So uh, I'm so sorry. Um, okay, guys, so let me just get to this other question because this was a really great question. I really like this one. Um, this person says, I am trying to heal a wound on my stump from necrotic tissue. Is there a secret to the diet that will help heal the wound? I get my dressing changed three times a week, wearing a vacuum dressing. It's healing, but it's taking forever. Yes. So um, one of the things that I actually loved to do in my years of training as a PD was wound care. I did a lot of wound care. Um, I worked in burn trauma unit, which I learned a lot of wound care there. And then in working with amputees and also just trauma centers, lots of wound care there. So that's something I actually really enjoy doing. Um, so when it comes to a wound, right, there's a lot that can be going on there, a lot that can be going on. Um, so first of all, if you have necrotic tissue, hopefully there are things in that dressing that they're putting into that dressing to help break up the necrotic tissue. There's a whole lot of stuff that they can use, right? And also there's just like the actual debridement, you know, is somebody when they're doing the dressing change, are they doing the debridement? Meaning, are they trying to take off that necrotic tissue? And there is an art to that. That's not just going in there like a caveman, right? There is a way to how on how to debride a wound properly. In my personal opinion, I think that the most successful wound is where you are helping with manual debridement, but then in combination with whatever is going on in the dressing. Usually I think it needs a little bit of both. Some wounds very, you know, they'll, they'll get better with just dressing changes and the kind of stuff you put on the dressings. For me personally, my wounds would heal the best when there was a little bit of mechanical debridement, meaning debridement that I was doing um, with my tools, and then also what was going on in the dressing. Okay. Now, uh, when it comes to vacuum dressing, okay, so that's when they put the vacuum pump on there. It's like a black sponge, and then they cover it with like a clear, almost like saran wrap looking thing, and then they turn the vacuum on. So what that vacuum is doing is exactly that. It's, it's, uh, encouraging uh, the circulation to really come to that area. And it's helping close the wound edges in, right? So there's a few factors that you need for good wound healing. The first and foremost is the absence of infection, right? You got to clear out the nasty necrotic dead tissue. Necrotic means infected tissue, dead tissue. That's what necrotic means. It's dead tissue. It ain't coming back and it needs to get out of that wound. Second thing is you need good circulation, right? If you have a healthy wound bed, meaning that there's no necrotic tissue and you have good circulation, you're going to get wound healing. When you don't have a healthy wound bed and you don't have good circulation, that wound is just going to stay there and it's going to take 
forever, or it's going to become a static wound, meaning it's not changing, it's not doing anything, and it's not progressing, okay? When you have something that's a static wound, this is where your wound care team needs to come into play and say, okay, what's going on? Why isn't this wound getting any better? Do we need to change the dressing, the kind of stuff we're putting into the dressing? Do we need to be a little bit more aggressive with the wound, right? Do we need to kind of instigate a little inflammation and get it to start healing again, okay? Or chronic wound. Sometimes we call it a static wound, chronic wound, right? So one of the things that we do look at is nutrition, right, when it comes to wound healing. Okay. So we said that circulation is important for wound healing. Well, what will affect circulation? So a couple of things. First thing is albumin. Okay. So albumin is a protein that's made by your liver and albumin goes into your bloodstream and it helps keep the fluid from leaking out of the blood vessels. It keeps everything in place. Just think of it like a guard. Albumin is like the little security guard walking through the hallway to make sure that everybody is tucked away where they need to be, right? So without enough albumin, right, the fluid is going to come start coming leaking out of the blood vessels, right? You're going to get edema, pitting edema to be more specific, right? So if fluid is leaking out of your blood vessels, then that means your circulation is going to be compromised. And that area around that wound is also going to be compromised, right? So again, these are just several little things that people will look at when they're doing wound care. So when it comes to nutrition, we will look at albumin levels. Now, albumin levels, right, it's, a, it's also considered part of your liver function test. And there's a whole pages of reasons why a doctor may look at albumin levels in a patient. Nutrition is just one of them, okay? Just one of them. Low levels of albumin could potentially indicate malnutrition. And that's just one of the many, many, many things, guys. Okay, I'm just talking specifically as it regards to wound healing, right? So when we were in the hospital, and especially when we had someone who had a lot of bed sores that were not healing, one of the things that as PTs, I remember my mentor, Paul, telling me, ask the doctor to check albumin right? And a lot of times that albumin was low, which means we'd have to call the dietitian in to come and adjust the patient's diet to include, I think, more protein and more hydration, right? To help keep that albumin and help boost the albumin levels. Okay. Yes. Protein helps a lot. And again, I am not a dietitian. I'm not anything like that. This is just, this is just things that I know as it relates to, um, clinical care that I've done over the years as a physical therapist, right? So if I had a wound that was not healing on one of my patients, one of the things that would trigger in my brain is, hmm, how's the albumin level doing? Second thing, when it comes to nutrition and wound healing, glucose levels, right? If you're diabetic, you got to get that glucose under control because all of that is affecting the quality of your circulation and the quality of your blood vessels, okay? Even if you're not diabetic, I would say get your glucose checked. It's just a quick little finger stick that they can do. You can do it at home. You can do it at your doctor's office, right? Sometimes people's glucose levels are kind of just going haywire when their body's in an inflammatory process trying to heal a wound, right? So these are just things to think about and to ask your doctor. Let me just see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Emily says protein helps a lot with wounds. Dawn says remove the necrotic tissue and trying to build the tissue back. And I have a healthy wound bed. Okay, good. So if you have a healthy wound bed, then Dawn, again, maybe you can just ask your doctor, hey, can we just do a, a blood check? And specifically, it's under the, the, oh, good heavens. Complete metabolic profile. Good heavens. Sorry, guys. It's late right now. CMP, and I'm just going to write this down, albumin. Okay. And again, I'm not a doctor guys. This is just me giving you just suggestions that I've learned over the years. So Don, if you are working with a wound care team, which it sounds like you are, you can ask the nurse practitioner or the doctor and just say, Hey guys, can we check my albumin level? You know, can we just see what's going on? And Don, it could be, especially, you know, I don't know the size of the wound, even in a healthy wound and one that's closing in, it can take time. Okay, but the good news is if you have a healthy wound bed, okay, and hopefully if you don't have any other issues going on, it may just be taking time and you might need 
more, just more protein to have support there. Right. Eh? Jerry Ann says, I've had a vacuum before too, and I'm getting home wound care at home. Right now they're putting umbilical grafts on and my stump is healing beautifully. Also faster. They say eat lots of protein, protein and hydration. That's another big one right there. Protein and hydration when it comes to any kind of healing and especially with the wound healing. Um, so Dawn says it's growing new tissue now and adding collagen. Good. So it sounds like it's moving in the right direction, Dawn. Yeah, it might feel like it's taking forever, but if if it's moving, then you're seeing changes and that's a good thing. Here's another thing just to kind of like put in the back of your head. Sometimes you can have a nice clean wound bed and it's just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. It's not getting worse, but it's not getting any better. And again, this is like an old school technique. We're talking like woo, old school sometimes. And again, this is only on the, on the recommendation of your wound care specialist. This is not something you do. This is only wound care specialist, right? Sometimes we would take like a small, small scalpel and just make little, like little hashtags, like little hashes in the wound. And what that would do is that would help stimulate the, the healing process all over again. It would stimulate the inflammation process and kind of like wake up the wound again to start the healing process again. That was a little trick we would pull every once in a while and a very, very, very specific wound. But Don, in your case, it's, it sounds like things are moving in the right direction. Maybe you just need an extra boost with that protein. And again, getting that albumin che level checked, right? So how is the glucose and inflammation related? And again, Van Gerger, there's, there's someone I'm hoping to bring on the show later this year, fingers crossed, that they are the experts on this when it comes to nutrition and glucose and inflammation in the body. And I'm really hoping that this entity will come on the show um, because it would be such a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing to bring on the show. But basically when it, when it comes to glucose and diabetes, you know, you have sugar going through your body and it's not being processed well, it's going to affect your veins, right? And it's going to affect your veins. So the same way that cholesterol gets built up in plaques in our arteries and causes all sorts of problems with our heart, the glucose can affect the quality and the flexibility of our veins and arteries, right? So the veins tend to become stiff. They're not as nice and flexible and juicy as they used to be, right? So if that's happening, then the blood is not going to be circulating as efficiently through that area and it's going to compromise the circulation. Yes. So A12 is 6.3, A1C is 6.2. And, and Don, I'd have to go back and check some of these levels again. I'm <laughs> Limkind Foundation is saying if you smoke, quit. Worst thing for a wound. Totally agree. Totally agree. It's kind of insane how they did real real time studies on people who were smoking and and having the Doppler, you know, that little Doppler ultrasound that they put on your leg to check for blood clots and the person's puffing away and they can see almost in real time, almost immediately the effects of the nicotine and smoke. It's it's insane. Insane. So, yeah, don't even ask me what I think about smoking because you don't want to you don't want me to go there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. I think I covered everything. Ha. Huh. I do guys stick with me for a second. Cause I need your advice. I want your input on this. So I mentioned before I'm starting a podcast and a blog, um, on this podcast. And then guys, this is because for the past, like six years, I've been doing the show. Y'all have been asking me to do a podcast and I'm finally, finally going to be able to do it. So I want to know, what do you want to see on that podcast? Do you want me to upload my Wednesday night live shows like this one and upload it onto the podcast so you can listen to it on your way to work or the next morning? Or do you want me to create new content, like specific topics to talk about on the podcast? Or do you want me to do both? I want to hear it in the comment section. So either you want just the live show upload, new topics, or both. I need your comments in the comment section. Don says, I just want to get back into the ambulance and get back to my job. I will be the only W amputee in the service. And Don, I have no doubt with your perseverance that you're going to get there. It sounds like you love what you do. I don't think I've ever met a paramedic who didn't love what they do. Um, and I think you're headed in the right direction. And I'm, I'm, 
I'm glad to hear that you have a wound care team. I can't tell you how many times I have encountered people on my show, uh, patients who have come into my clinic with these horrific wounds and they don't have a wound care team. Nobody thought to send them to a wound care specialist. So I am very hopeful for you, Dawn, that while it may take longer than what you're hoping for it to, that you will get the right healing that you need so that you can get back to your job. And I want to hear from you, Dawn, the day you do go back to work, because I'm confident that that's going to happen. Oh, good. I'm glad you guys are saying both, because that's what I was going to do anyways. <laughs> So <laughs> I am glad to hear it. Oh my gosh. Yay. No, Tom, I'm going to swing it because now I am finally going to, I have some extra um, help um, and I'm so excited about that. So yes, I will put both of them up there. I will be putting the Wednesday night show and I'll also put new content. Um, so guys, I am putting my email address. This is for those of you who are new to watching the show. Uh, you can send me your questions there. You can send me your questions through a, the phone text services that I just had. And this is also for folks who are watching the replay. You can send me things there. Guys, feel free to start sending me topics. I know some of you filled out that survey last in 2023 and it was incredibly helpful. Uh, please feel free to send me topics on things you want me to talk about on the podcast, on the blog. If there's any favorite live shows that you have that you want me, you're like, Cozy, I really want you to put this particular show on the podcast, like a show that I've already done in the past and I can put it up there. Um, David says, whatever you have time effectively do, I know you will probably do both. You know it, Pastor Dave, you know I will. Um, Don says, never smoked and no alcohol. Props to you, Don. And that's gonna be a huge part of your success. Um, okay, guys, I am gonna wrap it up for this evening. Oh, Tom is doing Pure Visitor tomorrow too. Okay, I've gotta stop reading the comments because I really do need to close the show down because I have to go. <laughs> All right, guys, as always, thank you for letting me be a part of your life this evening. Ooh, next week, next week, guys, I've got Ronnie Dixon from Prosthetic, Prosthetic and Orthotic Associates of Tennessee coming into the show. It's my first sponsored show of 2024. Woohoo! Um, it's basically going to be open season on Ronnie. So instead of hearing me chit chat, chit chat, chit chat, y'all are going to be asking him your questions. So get them ready. Don't go easy on him. Bring me all of your hard questions regarding prosthetic and everything about amputee. And we're going to have, we're going to put Ronnie in the hot seat and he's going to be answering these questions. So next week, Wednesday, February 7th, we're going to be here. All right, guys, as always, thank you for being, letting me be a part of your lives this evening. And I will see you next week. Same bad time, same